Creator, may your spirit and guidance be in us as we work for the benefit of all our people, for peace and justice in our land, and for the constant recognition of the dignity and aspirations of those whom we serve. Amen. Thank you. Members, as your speaker, it is my pleasure to welcome you back to the Legislative Assembly today. Our chamber remains physically distanced and we continue to operate in this COVID-19 environment. I want to thank all members for their cooperation. Although physically distanced from each other, we must continue to work together. That is how we can best serve the people who elected us to represent them. I look forward to the debate and discussion you will have over the next few weeks. These decisions will have a direct effect on our residents. I remind all members to conduct themselves in keeping with the rules of this assembly. Show respect for one another and for this institution. As your speaker, I will do my best to lead by example. However, it is my role to enforce our rules and I am prepared to do so. Although the assembly remains closed to the public, media are welcome in the gallery. We continue to broadcast and live stream our proceedings. It is important residents see and understand the work being done. Throughout this sitting, interpretation will be offered into Chippewan, French, North Slavey, South Slavey, and Klicho. I thank the interpreters for their hard work. And please be mindful and try to talk slow so they have time to interpret. Interpreted video of our proceedings will be broadcasted on our television channel and will be available on our YouTube channel. Members, October 8, 2020, it was Ombud Day in Canada. This year, the Northwest Territories marked this day with an Ombud in place to serve residents. Later today, I will table the first annual report of the Ombud. And now, it is my duty to advise the House that I have received the following message from the Commissioner of the Northwest Territories. It reads, Dear Mr. Speaker, I wish to advise that I recommend the Legislative Assembly of the Northwest Territories the passage of Appropriation Act Infrastructure Expenditures 2021-2022. Supplementary Appropriations Act Operations Expenditures Number 2, 2020-2021. During the second session of the 19th Assembly, yours truly, Margaret M. Tom, Commissioner. Thank you, members. Orders of the day. Minister Statements. Minister Statements, Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I also want to welcome members back to the Legislative Assembly as we resume the second session. I look forward to working together as we endeavour to keep residents safe from COVID-19, support industry and residents, and make progress on our mandate commitments. Mr. Speaker, when I delivered my first sessional statement in the House last December, no one could have predicted what the future was going to hold. This pandemic has been like nothing many of us have ever experienced. Over 37 million people worldwide have contracted COVID-19, and over a million people have died since the pandemic started. More than 9,000 Canadians have lost their lives to this virus in less than a year. Every country, community, and family is being impacted by COVID-19. In Canada, provinces and territories grappled with the, how best to contain the spread of the virus. All jurisdictions took immediate steps to protect the health and well-being of residents in the face of a challenge we're still learning about. In the early days, our efforts were swift. 
our government responded to the orders of the Chief Public Health Officer and made protecting the health and well-being of residents and our communities a top priority. We implemented travel restrictions, launched Protect NWT and 811, established border controls and isolation centres. We invested millions in personal protective equipment for both health and non-health workers, testing and contact trace testing, and ensuring that the healthcare system was equipped to handle an increase in cases. Mr. Speaker, our early interventions have paid off. Residents of the NWT have been safe. Our communities have not experienced loss of life as a result of this virus and our biggest risks are being managed. Like Atlantic Canada and other territories who implemented strict controls, we were able to limit COVID-19 in the NWT. It is important to mention that our success in maintaining the low numbers would not have been possible without the collective support from all of us. Indigenous and community governments who supported our measures, MLAs, the media, and community leaders who help spread the messaging, minds, private enterprise and non-governmental sectors who put the lives of residents first. The many individual employees in various sectors put in their own lives on the line to help. And all the residents who abided by the Chief Public Health Officer's orders were all critical to keep our numbers where they are today. Mr. Speaker, the measures the government of the Northwest took, however, or Northwest Territories took, however, did not materialize on their own. Hundreds of public service workers stepped up to help in our efforts. Over 180 employees helped on the front lines, but behind this, hundreds more within departments helped with the organization, policy development, and implementation of our COVID-19 response. Our employees are the backbone of this government and their dedication showed as they worked tirelessly to ensure our response was as effective as possible. I am extremely proud of our civil service and I sincerely thank them for all of their hard work. Mr. Speaker, parts of the South, South have recently announced that they have entered their second wave and the number of cases in Canada is increasing to levels we haven't seen since the early days of the pandemic. While our response to the initial outbreak of COVID-19 was successful to prepare for the second wave, we have to use what we have learned from what we experienced. One of the things we learned was that having necessary resources housed in multiple departments was challenging. Many of the requests and inquiries involved various departments, which sometimes resulted in less than timely responses. We also heard that as much as possible, people want the supports provided by the GNWT pre-pandemic. As well, we heard that our employees and departments were stretched thin, trying to help with the pandemic response and doing the best they could to complete their normal work duties. Keeping re residents safe during the ongoing pandemic continues to be our priority and is why we propose the COVID Secretariat. The Secretariat will house the Border Patrols and Enforcement Team, isolation units, distribution of personal protective equipment to non-health care providers, 811 and Protect NWT. The Secretariat will focus on the COVID response, which enables departments to, to focus on service delivery and implementing our mandate commitments. Mr. Speaker, as was stated by the Governor General during the speech from the throne recently, the last six months have laid bare the gaps in our society. As well as implementing the controls to enforce the Chief Public Health Officer's orders, we have also provided supports for residents and businesses to help during this pandemic. We invested in childcare for returning workers and financially supported our municipalities and Indigenous communities. We provided supports for businesses, employers, schools, students and income assistance participants. As well, we invested millions in support of our most vulnerable members of our communities. Our response to COVID-19 will cost money, real money. But as one Indigenous leader reminded me, how much money is one life worth? 
The COVID-19 pandemic has had significant impacts on our territory and economy and has created new challenges for pursuing the GNWT priorities. Recovery is key and we need to ensure our people have jobs and our businesses are thriving. We also have to keep health and safety, housing, food security and education top of mind to improve the lives of all NWT residents. Now, more than ever before, we need to be investing in our people and support them through this challenging time. We know this will cost money and we clearly cannot do this alone. We have been meeting regularly with other jurisdictions and the federal government throughout this pandemic. Canada recognizes our unique realities and the recent speech from the throne identified the exceptional needs of the North. We will continue to work with all governments to ensure that when we talk about economic recovery, investment in housing, transportation, broadband, energy infrastructure, and protecting the most vulnerable, the North continues to be recognized as needing special consideration. We need to close the gap between Northern and Southern Canada, one that has existed long before COVID-19. Canada's commitment to ensuring people aren't left behind aligns with the priorities outlined in our mandate to ensure a prosperous territory where our residents can thrive for generations to come. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we need to get on with the business of government. The COVID-19 pan pandemic is not going to end in the immediate future. While we must ensure we keep the health and well-being of residents at the forefront, we cannot lose sight of the work we were all elected to do by residents of the Northwest Territories. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, our relationship with Canada is critical to our success, success as a territory. This morning, alongside Indigenous leaders, the YWCA, Member of Parliament Michael McLeod, and Minister Chinna, we met with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau for a roundtable discussion on Northern housing needs. This issue is important to our government and we hope this meeting has kicked off a broader discussion about for how we can find innovative ways to address the dire need for housing in the Northwest Territories. This is an example of our commitment to building strong collaborative relationships with other stakeholders, with our stakeholders, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to find ways to work with Canada, Indigenous and community government partners and the NGO sector to improve the lives of our residents. We must continue to work towards a strong North and a resilient economy. As we move forward, we will continue to pursue economic and social opportunities that provide sustainable benefits, as well as address the direct impacts of climate change that our territory is experiencing. We need to advance our long-term priorities, particularly when it comes to growing our economy and ensuring a healthy, vibrant, and edu educated territory for years to come. Of critical importance as well, we must continue to work with Indigenous governments to conclude negotiations, define the implementation of the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous People, and work with the federal government in the development of a National Murdered and Miss Missing Indigenous Women and Girls Action Plan. COVID-19 certainly has taken the focus of this government. However, departments still have made progress towards meeting our mandate objectives and I'm confident that we'll be able to complete a number of our mandate areas during this term. During the February 2021 sitting, we will document in detail the progress we've made on our mandate commitments. Mr. Speaker, it was just over a year ago that we were all elected as the 19 MLAs to represent the people of the Northwest Territories. Who knew when we began that we would face challenges like no other government? Because of the seriousness of this pandemic and the needs of our residents, it is essential that we all work together. It is critical that ministers and MLAs work together along with Indigenous and community governments, businesses, non-government organizations and residents to find solutions to ensure the future prosperity of the Northwest Territories. 
By working together on areas of shared priorities, we will advance our objectives and better serve the people of the Northwest Territories. Mr. Speaker, we must move forward collectively and collaboratively. We have no choice. The safety of our residents and future of the Northwest Territories depends on it. And by working together, I am confident that we can find success as the 19th Legislative Assembly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Premier. Minister Statements. Minister Statements. Member Statements. Member for Hayer South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I am proud to say I was born and raised in the NWT. I was taught to respect all people whether or not I agree or disagree with them. And most importantly, I was taught to be principled in my beliefs and to believe in others. What has this got to do with being a politician? I would say everything. It reminds us that we are here, not for ourselves, but to represent those people who placed us here. <coughs> the same people who are just trying to stay healthy, trying to raise a family, trying to put food on the table, and trying to keep a roof over their head. Mr. Speaker, it has been a little over a year since we were sworn into office. When we first came together as newly elected MLAs, we all discovered or all discussed the need to work together, the need to be respectful, the need to be open and transparent, all so we could provide effective and meaningful representation for the people of the NWT. We agreed to standards we'd follow. We have not lived up to those standards. At the outset, we all appeared to get along and everything was friendly and respectful. It took only a short period of time to realize the first sign of splinters developing between members. It had little to do with how we were going to work for the people of the NWT, but had more to do with egos and personal aspirations. <coughs> it is apparent we have experienced some turbulence. However, collectively, it is now up to us to work through it while moving forward. Mr. Speaker, I, or any of us for that matter, do not have time to child mine cabinet or regular members. We all know there is limited financial resources, we all know the priorities, we all know the mandate, and most importantly, we all know the issues facing our constituents and communities. We are here to address those very issues by providing collaborative solutions that will use our resources efficiently while providing positive and long-lasting benefits to the residents and businesses of the NWT. Mr. Speaker, it is time to put our personal differences aside, be respectful, work together, and most importantly, listen to each other and our constituents. We have only three years left to actually advance the priorities we set for ourselves. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Haver South. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Thabacha. Mr. Speaker, one of my first member statements in this House was about the Department of Lands and their recent increase on the minimum price of lease rent costs for leaseholders on territorial lands, which is administered and managed within the Lands Department. Mr. Speaker, the Department of Lands increased the minimum rent cost for territorial land leases by $690. It went from a minimum cost of $150 and jumped to a minimum land lease cost of 840 annually. This is a huge rent increase to absorb all at once. The rationale from the Lands Department for this large increase in rent minimums for territorial leaseholders is because the rates had not been adjusted for 20 years. So the Department of Lands decided to apply 20 years worth of unchanged rent minimums and increase the cost all at once, rather than staggering the increase at a nominal annual rate as done with property ta taxes, for example. Moreover, Mr. Speaker, earlier this year, amid our government's initial response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Department of Lands put out a statement which wavered the land lease fees for all existing surface disp dispositions for the fiscal year 2020-2021. Cabin Radio reported on this story further on May 11, 2020, stating that the government of the Northwest Territories would collectively save residents and businesses 2.7 million, 1.4 million of which was provided re relief to all the mines. Mr. Speaker, I suspect that the Department of Lands would not have wavered these costs if it only affected smaller leaseholders by regular people. 
I am convinced that the government of the Northwest Territories only applied this waiver across the board because it primarily benefited the mining sector and large businesses. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, I firmly believe that all rights-based land leaseholders must be exempt from this policy and all permanent and long-term time residents of the NWT must be dealt with fairly. A 5 to 10 percent increase is sufficient for all residents I just mentioned. If anything, I think the bulk of the rent increases should rest with the non-NWT leaseholders. I will have questions for the Minister of Lands later today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Sabatra. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Kamlik. Mr. Speaker, today is the first sitting day of our second year. The air outside is fresh, and after seven long months of COVID, today is a good day to hit the reset button. Last night, I spoke with a bright young student ma named Maggie, preparing for today's class presentation on the NWT. I asked her about her favourite NWT thing, and her response was the ice castle. Her favourite thing is a local king in Carhartts that cuts his castle from our frozen lake to create a community that vibrates with excitement, and I love that. A year ago, I stood here and congratulated my colleagues because together we made history. I said last year was not only a turning point in history for the NWT, but the world. 2019 was indeed a global turning point. It gave us the non-refundable gift of COVID-19. This year, we have all been challenged and tasked with looking at our world different. But Mr. Speaker, while the GNWT is tasked with keeping Northerners safe, this assembly cannot lose sight of our individual and collective commitments to the people we serve. We are all ready to see COVID-19 go, but we need to continue to find ways to work with it. Northerners have long been known for their resiliency and ability to care for one another. This year, government has shown its ability to react, changing policies, finding funds, and working different in record time. While it may feel that COVID has slowed much of the world to a screeching halt, it has also created momentum and opportunity, and it is up to us to keep that momentum going. COVID is still a top concern, but I speak daily with constituents concerned about Northern procurement benefit retention, training skilled workers, economic drivers for the NWT, as well as addictions and wellness supports. We have what work to do, Mr. Speaker. A year ago, we shared what we wanted to accomplish, and I asked us to define our collective why. Listening to my colleagues, it is clear that we know our why. Every day, we share stories of Northerners determined to survive and thrive. And with them, we work for a stronger North, not for just ourselves, but also for the next generation who want to be leaders in their own communities, this territory, or even maybe the Ice Castle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Cam Lake. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Ditcho. Let's see, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Government of Northwest Territories has a living, breathing document titled 2030 Energy Strategy. <clears throat> the goal of this strategy is to guide the development of secure, affordable and sustainable energy for transportation, heat and electricity, support energy efficiency and conservation, and promote renewable and alternative energy solutions for the NWT. Mr. Speaker, it is quite exciting to see the Department of Infrastructure's Energy Division create such a document that shows promise of savings to cost of living items such as power costs and could very well create long-term employment in the communities. The Infrastructure Department is incorporated in this plan via wood pellet boilers to most of the GNWT's infrastructure such as schools, health centers and airports thus creating savings in fuel use and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Mr. Speaker, what I note is that the energy plan is not being put to action within the Northwest Territories Housing Corporation, considering their stock of approximately 2,400 units spread out across the Northwest Territories. Mr. Speaker, I will have questions for the Housing Minister at the appropriate time. Masi. Thank you, Member for Decho. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Yellowknife North. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, firstly, I appreciate MLA Cleveland's passion for, uh, as she called it, the ice castle, but I feel I'd be remiss if I did not correct that it is a snow castle. Uh, the Snow King would not allow me to get away with that. 
Mr. Speaker, starting April 1, 2021, the City of Yellowknife's Fire Department will no longer respond to calls along the Ingham Trail in my constituency, leaving residents of that area without fire protection. Now, Mr. Speaker, I want to reflect on how we got here, as I believe if many systemic problems were not solved, that my constituents still would have access to fire services. I believe if we properly funded our municipal governments according to the funding formula we agreed to, they could probably find it in their budget to continue to provide emergency services. I believe if we entered into proper MOUs with municipalities to provide emergency services outside of their boundaries, they would continue to provide this service. I believe if we settled Acacho and gave them the nearly half million square kilometers of their land back, we probably could have found a few square kilometers to give Ingram Trail residents title to their properties and they could in turn pay taxes and get services. I believe if we address the fact that there are people living in recreational leases and we know that and we accept it, yet we do not address the problem, we probably could have found a way to provide them services. However, Mr. Speaker, we have failed to do all those things and as such my constituents, after decades of service, will not be able to call 911 and get a fire truck if their house is on fire. I don't blame the city of Yellowknife for the decision that is their mandate. I blame the Department of MACA for not responding quickly enough to resolve this issue, such that we have six months to try and find a way such that none of my constituents picks up their phone and their house is on fire and no one comes. Mr. Speaker, I am afraid the GNWT won't move fast enough to solve this problem, just as they have not moved fast enough to solve all of those previous problems that led us here today. Mr. Speaker, I will have questions for the Minister of MACA, that I, and I hope we can get an agreement in place with the City of Yellowknife and give them some funding such that my constituents can continue to have fire services. And more importantly, I hope this government can make some action on all of those issues that got us here today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have questions for the Minister of MACA. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Tunaday Welding. Uh, much to Mr. Speaker. Um, to start off, I'd like to begin by welcoming all my colleagues back and uh, getting back to the grind. Um, this first year in office uh, has been uh, tumultuous, to, to say the least, uh, given the ongoing global pandemic uh, that we have been dealing with so far. Yeah. Um, Mr. Speaker, going forward, I'm hoping to continue um, building on the work we've done so far and uh, since last year's territorial election. And, uh, you know, I, I know we still deal, we, we dealt with a lot of deaths in, uh, in our communities, a lot of elders, and, um, you know, th it's very sad to, to deal with all our restrictions, and I'm hoping when all this is done, I'll, I really want to make sure that we have proper, uh, commemorate our elder, our lo ones lost during this pandemic, and I really hope we do something in the house, too, as well. And, uh, moreover, you know, Mr. Speaker, um, Given through all this, uh, all the, the pandemic uh, restrictions, uh, we need to still continue living our lives um, and do things and keep moving forward. And I want to recognize a few of my constituents. Uh, um, and uh, first one I wanted to mention was uh, Ch uh, Chaz Makai of Denny Nukwe. Uh She's an 18-year-old uh, Denny uh, and Cree woman of the, who flew to Toronto last month to compete in the Miss Canada Globe Punk competition. Uh, she plays fourth. And she and her parents and the whole community could not be more proud of her involvement in this event and putting herself out there and, uh, and pursuing her dreams. And I wish her the best of luck in future competitions. And going uh, just a little further north to uh, uh Mr. Speaker, I'd like to acknowledge the recent re-election of uh, Daryl Marlowe, Chief Daryl Marlowe uh, of the LKDFN, and to his second term in office. Uh, I wish him all the best, and I look forward to working close with him, with, with him and uh, building upon a positive working relationship uh, since we were built in the last year's election. Other thing I wanted to mention uh, quickly is uh, around the lake, you know, the, right now when we walked in, the wind is blowing really hard. It's, it's treacherous out there, you know, and uh, I, I encourage everybody, uh, all of our uh, constituents who are out in the water to be safe. And I wanted to, uh, you know, mention uh, uh, YKDFN, uh, some of their members, uh, rescuing some of their members out in the lake, you know, Nihatni and the LKDFN had a few rescues. But in particular, yesterday, in, in my home community, Denny Nukwe, uh, I'd like to recognize uh, a few gentlemen, Greg Lafferty, Scott King, and Brad King. They put themselves in harm's way. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to uh, seek your consent to finish my statement. 
Thank you. The members seeking unanimous consent to conclude a statement. Are there any nays? There are no nays. You may conclude your statement. Let's see your colleagues and Mr. Mr. Speaker. But uh, as mentioning those three gentlemen, um, they put themselves in harm's way to go out in the lake and uh, to rescue a couple of uh, community members and uh, that uh, that both their boat sunk and they had to go rescue them. They're stranded. And to do that, you know, you had to be selfless. You have to be brave. And for me, it was inspiring, and I'm really proud of them. Uh, and you know, to me, if we could draw some parallels, you know, that to me it was, like I said, inspiring. If we could. Uh, follow their lead, you know, and pick up and, you know, even though there's some rough waters out there, they went out there and faced adversity, they worked together, and they got the job done. And I'm hoping we, that we could draw that parallel here and we could get through all this, work with each other. You know, we're not going to always agree, but like I said, as one of my colleagues mentioned, you know, we got to be respectful with each, of each other and uh, look through past our differences because a lot of people are, are really depending on us in, the, in these times. Mr. Chau, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Tuna de Welde. Member statements, member statements, Member for Frame Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président. On June 3rd, uh, I made a statement in this House about the uncertainty and lack of communica cabinet communications surrounding the creditor protection proceeding for Dominion Diamond affiliates. The latest news is that the proposed sale of a caddy mine was, has fallen through because the insurance companies that issued surety bonds covering the reclamation liabilities would not agree to the deal. These surety bonds cover about $280 million of the $295 million in financial security for work that is supposed to be, in, uh, supposed to be done in place uh, under various licenses and permits. GNWT now has total discretion over the form of financial security for reclamation liabilities at a caddy and at any other mine. It's my understanding that GNWT also has to consent to the transfer or assignment of the water license, land leases, land use permits, and environmental agreement covering the caddy mine uh, if they're transferred to any new entity. It's not clear what Cabinet's position is on these assignments and whether any terms or conditions will or have been imposed. One of the terms and conditions should be that surety bonds are converted or changed to more reliable, irrevocable letters of credit from a chartered Canadian bank. Regular MLAs were never asked about or consulted about this matter. I'd also like to know what sort of an early warning system we have in place to ensure that GNWT is not left with a public liability from a caddy. The uh, insurance companies seem to have a problem with the new entity. The site has changed uh, ownership several times and it's nearing the end of its life. And we've already had some failures that GNWT was not able to adequately anticipate or mitigate. For example, the bankruptcy of strategic oil and gas and its Cameron Hills sour gas field. That should never have been accepted by our government under the devolution agreement. And then there's uh, North American Tungsten that also went under during our watch with a MacTung property as part of its financial security. I'll have questions later today for the Minister of Finance who has the lead on the Dominion Diamond Creditor Protection Proceeding. I'll see Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Nuvik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First, I would like to express my condolences to the families in my community and the surrounding communities on the loss of their family members over the last few months. Since I left this house in June, we have lost a lot of, just in our region alone, we have lost a lot of uh, elders, um, younger people in our region. We just lost another person yesterday. Um, during this time of loss, families are under extreme stress. In addition to this, they're, they're mourning, they're trying to arrange for funerals, and they're trying to do it in their, in their way, in their beliefs, in their burial ceremonies that bring some peace, some closure, with the addition of COVID-19 restrictions in place. Never in my life have I ever attended an outdoor funeral. As we are here still in phase two of the Emerging Wisely document states no indoor funerals allowed, no exceptions for out-of-territory 
uh, immediate family to attend that funeral without having to apply for an exception and wait for that response. Then they have, to, if they get approved, then they come to the territory. They have to wait another two weeks before they can attend a funeral. I find this rule to be disrespectful. No thought of how it affects the grieving process for our people and how families have to deal with this with very limited mental health while they're waiting. This goes against the sacredness of the ceremony and the burial process that I grew up with being disregarded. Mr. Speaker, what's even more upsetting is we see that non-NWT residents given permission, given exceptions to work in deemed essential areas like the mines, like construction, infrastructure construction, um, other private sectors as well as health. Why is this not considered with the same rules in place for family to attend funeral, Mr. Speaker? We can go to church now with up to 25 people with the ability to apply for more seats through the Chief Public Health Officer. This too is not right, Mr. Speaker. How does one measure a funeral ceremony is more at risk and less important than allowing a non? I seek unanimous consent to continue my statement. Thank you. The members seeking unanimous consent to conclude your statement. Are there any nays? There are no nays. You may conclude your statement. Thank you. I'll just go back. So yeah, we can go to church with up to 25 people with the ability to apply for more seats, but this does not include funerals. That is not right. How does one measure funeral ceremony is more risk and less important than allowing non-NWT resident essential workers for infrastructure and mining projects who are flying in from Edmonton on the same flight of all of us that I go home on every time I leave Yellowknife? The winter is on its way. We cannot deny families indoor funerals. This must be looked into. Our families need to mourn. They need to lay their family members to rest in a way that respects their culture and beliefs, Mr. Speaker. I'm hoping that I'm heard today and that we can do this in a safe way moving forward to respect our families. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for New Vic Twin Lakes. Member statements. Member statements. Member for Mumphrey. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, today in the Northwest Territories, everyone is dealing with the al alcohol and drug problem. We don't have a treatment center in the Northwest Territories. We used to have one, but we no longer have one. So anyone that wants to go to treatment, they go down south and monies are being spent on it. I spent a quarter of a million dollars last year sending northerners south for residential treatment. This is a leakage of revenue that could have been spent on northern jobs and business opportunities. But more tragically, it is a disservice to northerners who stand a better chance of recovering when their addiction treatment is provided here in the Northwest Territories. Mr. Speaker, recalling recent statements in this House, I am encouraged that the sad state of affairs that may soon be over. I refer to the promise uh, last June by then Health and Social Service Minister that was looking into again providing residential treatment here in the Territory. This was partly in response to the difficulties of Southern travels during the pandemic but it was also in response to the Department's Mental Health and Addiction Recovery Action Plan tabled in 2019, which promised more options for community-based addiction recovery. Mr. Speaker, I asked the government in May for a progress report on its plan for rest restoration of residential treatment here in the territory. I asked for it to be provided during this setting. So Mr. Speaker, at the appropriate time, I will have questions for Minister of Health and Social Service about how her department is progressing on this very important issue. Masi. Thank you, Member for Mumpui. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Nahende. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mary Louise Norwegian of Robertskin River was born to Joseph and Elizabeth Louvier. Norwegian, March 8, 1938. 
She was very close to her dad, who taught her everything traditional and how to survive in the wilderness. She was the second youngest of her siblings. She had four sisters and five brothers. Her favorite time of the year were spring and fall. In the springtime, she would trap beaver, catch fish, collect birch bark sap for syrup. In the later summer, she would travel up to her cabin on the Horn Plateau, where she would hunt moose, caribou, fish, and pick berries. On quiet fall days, she would spend time sewing and doing other crafts. As well, she enjoyed watching the ducks, geese, swans that would stop by the cabin at her lake as, she said goodbye, as they said goodbye as they continued on their journey south. She used to say, this is the most beautiful place on earth. Must be like this at the, uh, heaven's gates. She did her very best to raise her children eight as a single parent and passed on her traditional knowledge. Mary Louise was very proud of the fact that she was the first traditional woman to own her own home and land in the village of Fort Simpson. She had the opportunity to go on a traditional exchange program to Siberia for a couple of weeks. She would always say that people were so kind to us and would share what little they had with us. Many times she got close to death. There was one time she was alone at her cabin and cut her thigh to the bone with a chainsaw. When she would tell the story, she would say, my bush radio saved my life. For many years, she worked at the Fort Simpson Health Center as an interpreter, caregiver for elders, and prepared loved ones for burial. She re received the Wise Woman Award and was very honored for this acknowledgement. She always said she was thankful that she had the education and always challenged herself to be better. Life could be taught rough, especially at residential school, but without education, it could be a lot worse. She never gave up. She told her nephew, living off the land only is over. We cannot go back. Learning and training oneself is to be the best you can be so you can learn to use our precious lands properly and help each other. In her last few years, she suffered per from Parkinson's disease and was able to, wasn't able to go to her cabin. But her spouse of 25 years, A.J. Ar Arju, was by her side, cheering her up and assisting her where he could. He held her hand to the very end of her, as she took her last breath on July 20th. The family would like to thank the staff at the long-term care home for the excellent service they provided their mother during her time there. She would be sadly missed by all. Thank you, Member for Nahende. Our thoughts and prayers are with the family. Member statements. Member statements. Return to oral questions. Return to oral questions. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. I'd like to welcome our two people of the media here with us today. I'd like to thank you for joining us. It's always good to have an audience of this. So hope you're enjoying the proceedings. <clears throat> Acknowledgements. Acknowledgements. Oral questions. Member for Mumphoy. Yeah, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, uh Masi, Mr. Speaker, I made a speech statement regarding a treatment center, so I'd like to ask Health and Social Service a question. Social Service promised to consider territory and um, followed by a men, men, uh, mental health and addiction recovery action plan. Mr. Speaker, the TRC 94 recommendations, number 21, states that we, we call upon gov federal government to provide sustainable funding for Aboriginal healing centers to provide physical, mental, emotion, special harms caused by residential schools, to ensure the funding of healing centers in Nunavut and Northwest Territories. Mr. Speaker, I have a question for Minister of Health and Social Service. My first question is, in light of our department's promises that I've uh, stated in my statement, when can Northerners expect an end of ill advised practice of sending Northerners to Southern Institution for addiction recovery? Mr. Speaker, I'll see. Thank you, Member for Mumfui, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Member for Mumfui for that question. I'm unaware of a promise by the Department of Health and Social Services to revisit the question of Southern Base uh, in facility addiction treatment. In fact, recently, 
in response to a call for uh, proposals. Six new facilities, or six facilities in total, two new, uh, were approved for, for uh, Southern based addictions treatment. The reason it's in the South is because people can get in right away. They can choose the place they want to go. They can be in a co-ed or a gender specific uh, facility depending on their preference. And they have uh, access to a range of uh, services which we simply don't have in the Northwest Territories. So uh, I, just I just wanna be very clear that where we're focusing as a department is on aftercare, on things like on the land healing and what, what supports we can put in place to help people hang on to their sobriety when they come back. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Mumphrey. Monsieur, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, obviously um, uh, there's a bit of a challenge here to accept that the six new uh, Southern institution that we continue to send our people for some sort of addiction treatment there. Uh, leave, people live in the North, again, funding and money leave in the North. Uh, we're talking about millions. We're not talking about 10,000 here and there. Millions, Mr. Speaker. So I'd like to know uh, what options is the minister considering for return to residential addiction treatment here in the Northwest Territories? Once we had that before, could we have that again in the Northwest Territories? Must be, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Mumphrey, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member from Mumphrey for that question. Um, Mr. Speaker, the departmental budget for addictions treatment this year is $2.3 million. Um, there has been a decrease in the number of spaces available, which is why the department added two more facilities so that there's appropriate distancing um, during the pandemic. Um, we know that 45 people have attended inpatient treatment in the first six months of this year. Uh, 15 of them have completed their program. Uh, we're going to be low on numbers this year. They're more typically around 200. Um, the last treatment center we had open in the NWT was Nasa JK on the Capital Deche First Nation. And um, it failed for the reason that other treatment centers have failed, uh, a, lack of, uh, a lack of suitable staff, um, the inability to have a, to be able to do intake at any time and um, issues around confidentiality and people actually wanting to leave the north and all of their triggers for substance abuse and, and have a new start in the south. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Mumphrey. Merci, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have upwards of uh, well, new, I guess, uh, southern institutions that uh, the department is planning to work with. Uh, but at the same time, uh, given the amount of time that individuals can apply to go to southern institution, there is a wait list of, uh, at Palm Acres uh, of up to six months. And uh, if we had here in the Northwest Territories, Utilizing our own people, our elders, our, our healers uh, on the land program, which will go a long way. So the next question I have for Minister is, um, since uh, there's no options to consider uh, Northwest Territories residential uh, he healing center here in Northwest Territories, to what extent have the indigenous governments, indigenous healers, indigenous elders have been engaged or consulted in developing those options? Uh, as called by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, calls for action number 21 and 20. Mr. Speaker, Masi. Thank you, Member for Mumphui, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the question, uh, Member for Mumphui. Uh, the situation with the um, in based um, treatment based facilities. Uh, facility-based treatment to get those words in the right order is to uh, provide a range of options. So Poundmakers is one of the six. Aventa, which is for women, is another. Edgewood in BC. Fresh Start, which is for men in Calgary. An Indigenous Healing Centre called Renaissance in um, uh, Toronto. And another called the Thorpe Healing Centre in Lloydminster. Uh, so there are, there are a lot of different uh, choices there for, for people to make. 
this is a matter of public policy that affects all members, uh, all residents of the NWT. Um, also, uh, more particularly for Indigenous organizations, there's On the Land Healing, uh, which uh, has a dedicated fund of $1.8 million, and which is uh, available to uh, all Indigenous government organizations that make applications for it. And uh, that money is still available for this year. And so uh, I really um, would encourage uh, the member to ensure that his uh, IGO has applied for this money so that they can do their own on the land treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Mumphoy. Yeah, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Minister talks about choices. Um, we don't really have much choices here in the Northwest Territories. We have a six solid institution that we send our own people there. And they come back. I've witnessed myself in my region. One individual came back from a treatment and ended up back on the street. And unfortunately, that individual passed away this past summer because there was no aftercare program. Uh, this is a real issue, a real life issue, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Minister talked about on the land treatment program funding. What kind of funding is available? Comparison to the Southern Institution that we spend millions. How much are we spending here in the Northwest Territories on the land program? Has that been uh, also incremented over the years? Uh, that that will be my final question. Uh, I will come back to it as well, Mr. Speaker. Merci. Thank you, Member for Mumphui, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you. And thanks again to the member from Mofwi. The budget for the On the Land Healing Program is $1.8 million. The budget for the Southern Treatment is $2.3 million, so there's a difference there of $500,000. The On the Land Treatment Program was last increased last year in the last main estimates. Uh, so there is a robust uh, amount of money available there. As I mentioned before, uh, that fund has not been completely spent. Uh, on the contrary, only a couple of um, Indigenous government organizations have applied for it. So I really encourage uh, everyone who has connections with On the Land Healing to uh, make application to this fund so that, so that this, after, this piece of aftercare can be made, made available to all our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Frame Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, my questions are for the Minister of Finance, who has the lead on the Dominion Diamond Credit or Protection matter. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, GNWT also has to consent to the transfer or assignment of the water license, land leases, land use permits, and environmental agreement covering the Acadie Mine to any new entity. License and permits must be in place for any new owner to operate. Can the uh, minister confirm that GNWT must consent to the assignment of a number of licenses and permits to any new entity for the Acadie Mine? Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister responsible for finance. That is one of the critical roles that the GNWT plays, is that we are responsible in, as part of the bidding process that we would ensure that any prospective bidder, any prospective buyer can undertake the requirements of the environmental license and that includes undertaking or accepting the securities in a reasonable form. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Frame Lake. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the Minister for confirming that. If the uh, insurance companies would not agree to the sale of the Acadie mine to the new entity, it raises questions of what our Cabinet's position is. Uh, regular MLAs were not consulted in any way on this sale. Uh, can the uh, Minister tell us what Cabinet's position was or is on the sale uh, to the new entity uh, and who else it was conveyed to and when? Merci, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister responsible for finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's not the GNWT that gets consulted on the sale of this, this company between private entities. There's an ongoing negotiation that's taking place between Dominion Diamonds and prospective bidders. It's not one to which the government should be putting its hand into. Ultimately, in this case, being a CCAA proceeding, the court would be overseeing that process, would be overseeing that sale. What the role of the GNWT is, is to, again, ensure that our environmental process is respected, that securities are held uh, in, a, in an appropriate manner, uh, and, and 
and at that point, that is our role. That's the role that we perform. Um, so, uh, you know, as far as the role or the, the, the thoughts of Cabinet, uh, Mr. Speaker, number one, again, is to preserve that environmental process that we have. And number two is to provide an environment and an atmosphere that will ensure a profitable mining industry. So uh, if we're able to do that, then it's certainly my hope that there will be ultimately a successful bid on the table and that the mine will reopen. But it's certainly not our role to reach inside of that uh, pr private entity process. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Framley. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the uh, Minister for that. Of course, uh, we are at the table in those proceedings. Apparently, we have legal counsel there, and we do have a say in terms of the, the transfer of uh, any of these licenses. So I, I hope that it's exercised in a reasonable way and that this side is consulted. But, you know, the, the Dominion Diamond News release uh, said that the insurance companies that issued the surety bonds, uh, that they refused to agree to the sale to the new entity. So can the um, uh, minister explain what is going on? Why won't these insurance companies agree to the sale of uh, the, uh, the mine? Masi, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister Responsible for Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I certainly wish I could give a, a detailed explanation of what is going on, but again, it's, there's a large degree of what's going on is between private entities. So uh, I realize that on the one hand, uh, one news release is saying perhaps that uh, one side of the deal walked away, but it may well be that another party might be saying the opposite, that it was in fact another member uh, of that negotiations that were the ones that walked away or wouldn't agree. Um, so I think there needs to be some caution exercised before one of us here necessarily assumes what's happening. Um, from our perspective, you know, the, the, some of the parties are keeping us informed uh, on their perspective, on what they see happening in that sale. And again, our role really is to ensure our, our end of it is, is moving along in a reasonable fashion, and that is protecting the environmental process and ensuring that to the extent that there's a bidder who may require the assignment of the environmental securities or the environmental agreement, that we do what we need to do to ensure that that happens expeditiously. Um, Mr. Speaker, the government of Northwest Territories is not going to suddenly upend or change the environmental process that exists, the environmental agreements that exist. So um, at this stage, there's, there, you know, if the member requires me to allay those fears, and I'm certainly happy to do that, our hope is that this mine will reopen. Our hope is that that mine will reopen, that if it does, it will be assuming the environmental agreements that are already in place. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Framley. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the uh, Minister for that. Uh, of course, we all want to see the mine reopen, but we want it. I just don't want our government to get shortchanged, for the environment to get shortchanged in, in the process. So, But for the first time I can recall, GNWT accepted surety bonds as financial security as, for this particular mine. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, insurance companies don't stay in business by paying out. Uh, can the uh, minister tell us whether it is cabinet's position that these surety bonds should be converted to or replaced by the more reliable, irrevocable letters of credit issued by Canadian Chartered Bank, uh, and whether this GNWT has put this uh, as a condition of sale or assignment? Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister Responsible for Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this, it was always an expectation that over time the surety bonds that were being held for this particular mining industry would convert over to irrevocable letters of credit. Uh, that is not right now, um, a, well, to be very simple about it, it's not a concern right now, Mr. Speaker. From a perspective of the government, the surety bonds that we have can be called upon by the government if we need to. Uh, so from our perspective, they provide adequate security and assurance that if the, the bonds needed to be called if the securities needed to be called, that they'd be there. What they did provide was some flexibility to the company when it was initially um, uh, undertaking the environmental agreement process. So that provide that flexibility was there. Uh, it comes with uh, with protection for the GNWT. Um, and at this point, uh, there's there's really, from our perspective, no concern uh, in continuing as it is right now, um, and no intention of changing or or reducing the level of security that we have or the form that it's in. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Ditto. <coughs> Merci, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the Northwest Territories Housing Corporation has approximately 2,400 public rental units spread out over the NWT. Let's say for brevity, the units each consume approximately 1,200 litres 
diesel fuel per month. The total for the year for 2,400 public rental units is approximately 34.5 million liters of diesel fuel consume, consumed every year. If you were to stick a dollar figure to that, if we use an average of a dollar per liter, we're looking at $34.5 million per year on the use of uh, diesel fuels. Mr. Speaker, I would like the Minister to commit to developing an energy action plan for the Northwest Territories Housing Corporation that will reduce the use of fossil fuels and incorporate wood pellet boilers to the public rental units. Merci. Thank you, Member for Detro, Minister responsible for the NWT Housing Corporation. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Member, for your comments. Um, working with the energy, um, uh, um, decreasing the working with the energy plan for the Northwest Territories Housing Corporation is a priority. And um, right now, we have um, 3.9 million under the Low Carbon Economy Fund. That was uh, we work with the Department of Infrastructure to try to alleviate the um, the utilities and the um, oil and gas within our um, within our public housing units. We have also. We also had um, biomass projects that we do have throughout the Northwest Territories. We do have 2,600 units throughout the territory. The Housing Corporation is working um, towards um, uh, administering more energy efficiency within those public housing units. Um, I will commit to um, developing a plan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Ditcho. Merci, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that is good news to hear. Um, you know, the reason is we're constantly reminded of the date 2038. Nobody knows in the communities and in indigenous communities what that date really means. Uh, most people are in fear of that date that they will have no more units available for rent or housing of our people. Because every year from now until that date, the funding from the Canada the Mortgage and Housing Corporation, the CMHC, will deplete until there is no more funding available for operation and maintenance on that date. So, you know, will the minister act now in developing an energy action plan to extend the public rental housing program beyond 2038? Masi. Thank you, Member Pradecho, Minister responsible for the North Coast Territories Housing Corporation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Member, for your comment. Uh, my uh, answer, as I um, just to reiterate, yes, I, we will be working towards an energy uh, action plan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Decho. <clears throat> Masi, Mr. Speaker, it was nice to hear that again. Um, I look forward to the energy action plan that is innovative in the use of our natural forest resources that creates employment for our communities, the much needed employment, and I really look forward to that report. Um, hopefully it's not going <coughs> to be too far into the future that, uh, that we'll have something in front of us for review. Merci. Thank you. We'll let the minister respond. Minister responsible for housing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Member, for your comments. Um, work, like I had said before, that um, uh, energy efficiency efficiency is a priority of the um, Housing Corporation in, in developing our units. And um, I do recognize that you know we do have a declining CMHC funding as of 2038, and the Housing Corporation is working strategically. And how are we going to be? What are we going to be um, working with after the 2038 um, mark has come? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for New Victoria Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I understand that the Chief Public Health Officer has the power to make all of the uh, rules that have been in place and is not to be politically influenced. And we have heard this from the Premier in the past, uh, Minister. When this Emerging Wisely document was created, I would just like to know if the, um, this document was run by Cabinet before it was released to the public. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nuvik Twin Lakes, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you uh, to the member for Nuvik Twin Lakes. This is before my time over here, but my understanding is that yes, 
uh, Cabinet did have a chance to review the plan before it was made public. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for New Victon Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also understand that there has been many changes to this document, and we've heard that Dr. Candola has said this, that it's, it's, it's a moving document, it's a living document. Um, and there's been a lot of changes in there. Uh, there's been a lot of changes with the essential workers, who gets exceptions, who can get exceptions to go to communities now. Um, so how, how was this information passed on to the CPHO if there was no one to influence her decision on making changes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nuvik Twin Lakes, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. Uh, thank you. So just to be clear about what's happening here, the CPHO provides medical advice and uh, the Department of Health provides uh, policy about how to implement that uh, medical advice. So, um, as you know, um, people can apply to protect NWT or call 811 and ask for some kind of exception to the orders as they are written now, such as uh, no uh, uh, long-term isolation, that they can go to work during the day, or that they can, uh, they can go to a community that is not a hub community, and exceptions of that kind. Uh, so those are given to her office and she makes the choice uh, on um, an item-by-item -item basis by uh, assessing the risk. That's her primary measurement. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Newick Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, um, during the public briefing that we had in September, I did ask um, the Minister if they could review the restrictions around funerals, um, and I'm just wondering um, if the minister can tell me if the CPHO, if you know that they are reviewing this, this rule. Thank you. Thank you, member for New Victor Lakes, minister responsible for health and social services. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. Yes, the, the CPHO is fully aware that outdoor funerals are, are um, if not already over, will be over in, in a matter of weeks because of the temperature outside. It's my understanding that the protocol that's in place now will remain in place, but she is actively reviewing the funeral protocol and um, that there is a, a possibility of revised public health orders next month and, and that this would be the time we hear what she's decided about funerals. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for New Victor Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just have one question to the minister, is if she can ask the chief public health officer if she can move this up. Lakes are freezing at home in the north. We've already got blizzards going. We can't have outdoor funerals already. So it's already too cold. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Nevik Twin Lakes, minister responsible for health and social services. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have the opportunity to meet with the CPHO every week, and I will certainly make that point to her that it's urgent that, um, that there be uh, an alternative to outdoor funerals so that people can uh, grieve in a more comfort-controlled environment. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Camley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in March of this year, I asked then Health Minister, uh, sorry, the Minister of Health and Social Services about virtual care in the Northwest Territories. Since then, the GNWT has put together a three-phased approach to virtual care to address health care needs in the face of a global pandemic. Um, in regards to the advances that were made through the COVID-19 uh, pandemic as far as virtual care is concerned, I'd like to see the changes and advances that were made continue their momentum. So I'm wondering, for phase two of the virtual care initiative identified, uh, a need to create secure messaging between health care providers both within the Northwest Territories and with Southern care providers. What work has been done to date to address secure information sharing between service providers? Thank you. Thank you. Oral questions. Minister responsible for... for health and social services, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, uh, the particular focus of the virtual care work is between in-territory uh, providers, health providers, and in-territory patients. And uh, there has been some work done, although uh, COVID-19 reorganized priorities and that work has slowed down. Um, the, 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 we already have a head start because the secure messaging will be through the territorial EMR system, which is available in every uh, health centre and, and cabin that we have. So there's widespread uh, availability once uh, the secure messaging is, is developed for application across the NWT. The only other loose end is that um, we need to continue work with physicians in Alberta on uh, them being able to uh, access patients here, that they have the appropriate licensing, that we have compatible medical records, and that they can talk to one another effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Kamlik. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That leads quite nicely into my next question. And I just want to confirm first though, so are there currently no out of territory physicians practicing virtual care with NWT residents? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Cam Lake, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you to the member for, to provide, uh, for an opportunity to provide that clarification. Stanton Hospital has five Southern service providers providing virtual care, and the Family Physician Group has one Southern service provider providing virtual care. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Cam Lake. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, a standing barrier to providing virtual care is the barrier created by differential licensing requirements, which the Minister touched on. Um, and there's different requirements straight across Canada. So what work is being done to simplify the registration and lic licensure processes to enable qualified physicians or healthcare providers to provide virtual care across provincial and territorial boundaries? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Ministers. Kamlik, sorry, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the department right now is working on adapting the Alberta College of Physician and Surgeons uh, physician standards, and those standards include uh, a telehealth standard. And so, what the draft, what the department is doing, is uh, is adapting those to NWT circumstances. Step one. Step two, engage the key stakeholders with the content, such as the NWT Medical Association and the Health and Social Services Authority, so that they can provide their input into, uh, into that. And um, finally, there may be a need for legislative change in the Medical Profession Act. And if that's the case, we would certainly expedite work on that. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, member for Kamlik. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, one of the things we hear quite often in this House and also within committee work is the need for cultural sensitivity straight across the North in all the work that we do. And so I'm wondering, how is the GNWT working to ensure that the cultural, technological and language needs of all NWT residents are being met through virtual care? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Cam Lake, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the answer is that the service uh, now is, is not entirely seamless, but if residents uh, normally receive service in an in Indigenous language in the health clinic in their community, they will continue to receive those services. Uh, new patients, it, it uh, then falls to interpreters who are available in the health clinic or the health centre to uh, interpret for that, uh, for that uh, individual who's the patient. And so there, there is every effort to accommodate uh, people to speak their, their first language and to receive services that are culturally safe and appropriate. But I, you know, having said that, the technological end of this about connectivity in every community and the, the, how robust the bandwidth is, th this is a, a failing in our system that we need to address. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, communication between cabinet, regular members and cons constituents is very important. 
if this government expects to get most of our decisions right. Uh, COVID threw a curveball at this government's communication plan. Uh, I would ask the Premier, now that we have a year behind us and we have somewhat of a track record managing COVID, how will she ensure that we get our communications back on track between Cabinet and regular members? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Haver South, Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I do agree with the member that uh, communication has been difficult over the last few months. Um, once COVID-19 hit, uh, lots of us couldn't be, usually we're in the house all the time. Um, you know, there was workplace things had to be done. There was a lot of issues that came up. And communications is one of the hallmarks of consensus government. Before the pandemic hit, it was common to see ministers and members in the House on a regular basis. And both sides of the House would walk the floor and, and talk to ministers or MLAs, not only about issues, but just building that relationship and, and sometimes just going for, for lunch. Those things are gone, Mr. Mr. Speaker, since COVID-19. And so, um, like I said, we, we need to learn from the lessons that we've uh, experienced over the last few months. We, uh, you know, communications, we, we were focused on our health and safety and we, we kept trying to do the communications through normal processes. So we offered our list of briefings to committee all the time, not even thinking that committee didn't have the opportunities to gather as much just like we were. So we realized that was a mistake in an area. So how we're working on it going forward is we're going to provide more briefings, written briefings to standing committees in advance, not just waiting to say, can we present to you? We'll still give standing committees the opportunities to look at them and, and decide if they want a briefing on it or not, but um, we have to recognize that we're not always going to be in the House now. I do say that uh, that we do have an open door policy within the GNWT. A lot of members phone me in the evenings, pick up your phone if you need something, give me a call. Um, we can do virtual communications as well, whatever it means, but life has changed for all of us and I don't know when it's going to go back. So we have an obligation, all of us, to try to make sure that we are still reaching out to each other by the means that we have available. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Premier. Oral questions, member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this government has had a few problems with putting our message out to the public. The big one is the establishment of the COVID Secretariat. People were angry and they let us uh, know about it in no uncertain terms. Uh, I'd ask the Premier, has she had time to reflect on this and how will this government address the way we communicate with the public in the future? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Haver South, Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Communication is one of the areas that, again, is, is often undervalued within a government and yet so critical. And it really came to the forefront when COVID-19 hit how much we relied on our communications in the GNWT. I have to be honest, Mr. Speaker, in previous years when we have so many priorities and so many mandates, uh, governments had to make tough choices. And often it was the decision, do we increase our communications, which we need desperately, or do we provide the program that's in our, our priorities and mandate? I hate to say it, but oftentimes communications took the hit. And I, I understand that. But our communications team is trying to do their best, and on a stretch thin, as, as I had stated earlier. Um, but we owe it to the public. The Secretariat was a great example, and a great example of the first question, how we're going to relate with minister or members uh, better. Usually in previous governments, what happens was that we would present an initial brief to the members. Um, we'd take their feedback, we'd work on it, give and take, we'd go back, present it, and then we'd go public. The Secretariat, uh, on all, all of us recognized that uh, that process wasn't followed properly, and we didn't do a good job of communicating myself, communicating to the public. So, but I don't want to lose sight the Secretariat, we shouldn't be focusing so much on the lack of communication. We need to focus on the Secretariat about what it is. It's bringing our isolation units, our border controls, our PPE, our 811 and our, our Protect NWT together so it's, it's cohesive in one department and people can get back to work. So we're working on our communications. We recognized it was a huge issue. We've spent a lot of time with our communications team to try to get better on that and, and we will be coming out in the future with more communications. But Mr. Speaker, I do want to give credit. Um, communications team has taken a beating over the while and they are doing the best they can 
with the resources they have as well. And I, I do want to say that I'm proud of all our communications people. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Premier. Oral questions, member for Havers of. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, various businesses throughout the NFD have been suffering financially over the last few months. Can the Premier confirm what communication strategy is in place to ensure that businesses are being heard and responded to in a timely manner? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Haver South. Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When I first began here a year ago, I said that um, I wanted to engage with stakeholders more. Businesses are stakeholders, one of the, the sector. Um, I, I do believe that ministers, again, in the beginning, were engaging out there, talking to businesses, um, doing the best they could, and then COVID hit. And uh, everybody went into lockdown right across the territory. That impacted our communications, no doubt. Um, but now that we have a little bit of a knowledge on where we're going, the systems we need in place to deal with COVID-19, all ministers have been back at it and uh, trying to engage more with stakeholders. It's not only about telling our stakeholders, businesses, or who are, what we're doing. It's about, and I've been firm with that with ministers, Mr. Speaker, it's about engaging them before we make the decisions, whenever possible. So again, like I said, we kind of have a little bit of a handle on what we need for COVID-19. Um, the Secretariat will deal with that. Departments are back to nor trying to get back to normal business and, and meeting our mandate. And in stakeholder engagement is critical within that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Premier. Oral questions, member for Haverson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the people of the NWT want a champion. They want a leader, and they want to hear from that leader. In this instance, the Premier. They want her to show leadership and create enthusiasm by providing relevant information in a timely manner, not only on, not only on COVID matters, but just as importantly, the economy. I asked the Premier, how will she accomplish this? That is becoming a champion for the NWT. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Haver South. Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, like I said, uh, rushing all departments, rushing all of us, rushing to try to figure out what we needed to do to keep our people safe. Um, and I dropped the ball on the communications. I, again, I didn't realize how important it was. The Secretariat, the issue with the Secretariat, brought it to the forefront. It told us that we need to do better. Um, and so, like I said, our communications team is doing the best they can with the resources they have. But we took the time, we stepped back after that, and we took the time and we've met with our communications team and all the cabinet in honesty, and we looked at how we're going to actually have more of an all government communication strategy, how we're going to get out into the public more, how we're going to reach the public and, and work with the media more. So I think that uh, we just finished that exercise. You will see more in the coming weeks um, on how we're going to actually implement our communication strategy going forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Premier. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Tabacha. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister of Lands is, how, how is his department going to undo a major poor decision of the 18th Assembly that should have not happened without proper meaningful consultation on the land leases? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Thabatcha, Minister responsible for lands. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, as I've committed previously in this House uh, to the member and others, is that I've made a commitment to within the next three years to have the public la land regulations in place. And we're still on stride right now. We're two and a half years left in that commitment, and we're trying to get it done in that time frame or sooner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Thabatcha. Mr. Speaker, the Minister's responses to my office regarding land leases is unacceptable. After getting up in the 18th Assembly 72 times addressing this issue to the former Minister of Lands, why is this Minister not true to his convictions and not proactively changing the way he is dealing with this whole issue? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Thabatcha, Minister responsible for lands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I emphasize with the, the member 
yes, I was up there 72 times asking for it. And yes, I found the answers unacceptable. However, as soon as I became the minister, I directed the department uh, to, com to complete the regulations to we move forward. Just so the member understands, I also was asking questions, written questions, and bring forth to the minister about the challenges when we had with re residential leases and get that changed. For 31 times I asked them that and we were able to reduce that fee. So I understand the minister or the member asking the question and not being happy with it, but sometimes when we get answers, people are not happy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Thabacha. Mr. Speaker, I'm very concerned about the contents and tones of the threatening letters being sent to the people of the Northwest Territories who have land leases, and especially to my constituents of Fort Smith. Will the minister consider changing his department's policy and review the rationale of doing the right thing? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Thabacha, Minister Responsible for Lands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the letters being sent out to leaseholders are a legal document and should not have the tone, and we apologize if people see that there's a tone to it. What we encourage the member to do is get her constituents to reach out to our regional office and to have the conversation with our regional staff so they can under better understand what we're trying to do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Thabacha. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the letters are coming from Yellowknife, not from the regional office, just for corrections. Mr. Speaker, given the effects of this ongoing pandemic and its impacts on everyday life, would the Minister consider, for the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic, placing a freeze on all land leases for rights-based permanent and long-term residents. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Thabacha, Minister Responsible for Lands. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I would encourage uh, the member to get her constituents to reach out to the regional office so they can better understand that. Um, we're in a pandemic. We came up with a solution presently, and so we were happy to waive uh, the fees for a year. Um, starting April 1st, uh, 2020, um, which was $2.7 million from our coffers. So it was a commitment we made during this assembly, during this fiscal year, to do uh, proper things for our residents. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal and Community Affairs. What is the department presently doing to make sure my residents on the Ingham Trail do not lose fire services? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister responsible for Municipal and Community Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Member, for your question. Uh, MAC is currently um, in conversation with the City of Yellowknife. They did establish a working group, and um, we are looking at the Property Taxation Act and also the... Um the Area Development Act, sorry, and we're trying to find, um, to see what options are lay within those acts that would be able to um, work with the Ingram Trail and the um, and looking at the services that to be provided out, to be provided there. Also looking at if we if we were able to, um, under the Taxation Act, um, have the, the residents at the Ingram Trail contribute to that so we can um, look at other financial means for uh, providing fire services to the Ingram Trail. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Yellowknife North. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My concern is that uh, municipalities have been asking for changes to the Property and Assessment Taxation Act for decades, and Ingram Trail residents have been asking for resolution to how their taxes and fees were spent for decades, and we simply have months to resolve this problem. I, I believe there are some longer-term solutions, such as a volunteer service, perhaps, such as uh, incorporating the 
uh, the Ingram Trail such that they can have some control in their governance, but that can't be done in the next six months. So will the minister approach the city of Yellowknife with funding for an MOU to buy us some time to resolve this issue? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For Yellowknife North, Minister responsible for MACA. Uh, Speaker, thank you, Member, for your comment. Uh, currently, uh, right now, the um, the working group has just been established. Conversations are happening between MACA and the City of Yellowknife, and uh, there has no there has been no conversation about the financial means right now. It's uh, too mature, too premature to um, to establish any um, financial obligation or financial commitment to uh, to the Ingram Trail. But just for for the member that we are in conversations and these uh, these um, these uh, discussions are happening. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What's happened over time is that we've allowed more and more people to live on the Ingram Trail, such that it has close to, I have 200 constituents out there, making it one of the larger than many of our communities in the Northwest Territories. Uh, coincidentally, we have not adjusted our Hamlets Act, which has a threshold of 25 residents. Uh, they could incorporate tomorrow and would be entitled to millions of dollars, such that I do not think it is too early to be having the financial conversation. If we do not address this now, and if we do not, if we lose fire services, I'm going to recommend and corporation and I'm going to get millions of dollars when this is a hundred thousand dollar problem. So can the minister put a dollar amount to this and go to the city of Yellowknife? Thank you Mr. Speaker. Thank you member for Yellowknife North, minister responsible for MACA. Thank you. Thank you, Member, for your comments. We have to uh, consider that you know there's a consultation period that needs to happen within the City of Yellowknife. There are jurisdiction issues. The um, looking at providing fire services to uh, Ingram Trail is quite complex. This is not the only area within the Northwest Territories that is affected by uh, this conversation right now. But just for the Member's sake, that we do, we are in the conversation with the City of Yellowknife. This is happening, and um, I will keep the uh, Member informed as we progress. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My other concern is that there's a number of residents who I am sure do not know that their fire services got cancelled after decades, and I'm worried that they are going to call for a fire, and we will either, either we will be liable or the city of Yellowknife will be liable, as no one told them this service was cancelled. Can the department reach out to all those who have cabins on the Ingham Trail and inform them of the cancellation of the service and our plan to remedy it? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister responsible for MACA. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Member, for your comments. Within the working group that has been established, we are looking at an, an approach of how we are going to be um, addressing and consulting with all of the uh, residents at Ingram Trail. So uh, I will keep the member informed as the, as the department progresses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions, Member for Tunade Welde. Yeah, Masi uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Holy, we give a, uh, an initiation to our uh, a new health minister today. <laughs> I got a couple of questions uh, uh, for, uh, for the minister. Um, after hearing my uh, colleague from Mofi's uh, um, statement on addictions and addiction services. Um, so I guess I have a quick uh, preamble, I'll keep it brief. Um, I heard um, that there's 1.8 million allocated for on land funds available for uh, healing. Um, for me, I think it's important to have, you know, good metrics in place for aftercare and stuff and um, to make sure that we follow up with our people that are, that are healing and to make sure that they're doing well and also if we to let us know if we're doing a good job and if, if our programs and our funds for programs are successful. So, and I don't expect a response too quickly to this, but uh, I guess my first question is, uh, can we have a breakdown of that, uh, of, uh, that 1.8 uh, so far this year, 1.8 million, and, and uh, where are they being used? And, uh, and how much has been used so far this year? Mr. Chair. Thank you, Member for Tuna de Welde, Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from off week for that question, or pardon me, for Tuna Day. Um, the total budget for on the land funding is um, 1.095, and uh, the mobile treatment aftercare funding, and these are often pooled together, is 729,000, so the total is 1.8 million. So of that, $482,631 has been spent, and the two IGOs with 
uh, agreements in place are the Dutcho First Nations and the Inuvialuit Regional Corporation. So each IGO is allocated the same amount. So the on the land funding available to each IGO is $125,000 and the mobile treatment aftercare funding is 66350 So I can um, make a copy of this uh, page and I can make it available to the member so that he has that in front of him. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Tunity Weddle. Yeah, must show, Mr. Speaker. I think it's uh, important. And I had another question with going back to after care reporting. Um, I'm just wondering if there is um, measures in place before people go to treatment that, that there um, th there's a follow up to to say, you know, yes, how was your, you know, maybe you got three to months, three months, six months down the road, and to, to, to check in on them to, to see if they're doing well and if, the, if their treatment is has been successful or not, and to do those kind of increments. Must show. Thank you, Member for Tunade Welde, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for that question. I'm very interested in that follow-up as well, and it's my understanding that the department will start surveying people who go out to facility-based treatment and uh, check in with them whether they stay for the full time or they leave early, and to check in with them more than once when they come back to find out whether they've been able to retain their sobriety. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, Member for Tunade Welde. Mr. Show, Mr. Speaker, uh, I did have one uh, final concern. I think it's maybe it's just the communi communications piece. I'm not too sure. Maybe it could be an opportunity uh, for the department. Uh, I mean, if the if the, all this money is not uh, being accessed throughout the year, I'm just wondering if that's something that uh, the department could look at. Um, so. I uh, have in the, in the past, uh, say, past couple of years, have there been carryovers for this fund, for the online fund? Let's see, John. Thank you, Member for Tunde Welde, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I don't have a ready answer to that. I know that it's only recently that the, this money has been increased to $1.8 million. And given uh, the pandemic, I, I wonder if there will be a carryover this year because uh, at this point we've only spent about a third of it. So I, I can, however, get you more specific information and, and provide that in a written response. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Tunade Welde. Let's show you. Actually, I'm thinking about that. I do have one final question. And it, it, uh, start with a little, again comment. You know, there's a, this new uh, new announcement with sending to our, our residents to uh, people out uh, to Lloyd Minister in Toronto. Uh, again, I feel like this is a missed opportunity. I, I, I really feel that we need to get more value for out of our programs and where we're spending our money. Uh, again, it pains me uh, to see our funds go to the south. Uh, you know. I really think this is an opportunity here to bring back, uh, I know we can't address all the issues uh, uh, in terms of uh, drug and alcohol addiction because it, it is a problem that we all know that in this room. Uh, but if we could bring, revisit uh, not having our residents leave the territory and finding more ways to keep the money in the north um, and, and not leaking money, having this economic leakage per se. So uh, and I guess uh, my final question is, is there not still an appetite to do this within the department? Thank you, Member for Tunade Welde, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Tunaday Welladay. Um, there is no current plan to establish a facility-based treatment option in the Northwest Territories. The last one was Natsa JK. Uh, it costs as much to run Natsa JK as it does to contract these six other places in the South. And so uh, we feel that it's better value for money to have the facility-based treatment in the South, notwithstanding the fact that that money is not being spent in the North. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Frame Lake. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to ask some more questions of the Minister of Finance around the uh, Dominion Diamond uh, situation, and I apologize she doesn't have these questions uh, before. But um, 
I know that in her response to some of the questions I asked earlier today, she talked about uh, how when GNWT is involved in these proceedings that uh, they make sure that uh, the court knows about uh, the business interests at stake. And of course, we all want to see the mine continue. But one thing I didn't hear the minister talk about was uh, um, you know, the, we, we have a lot of workers uh, at the mine site. Some of them are actually organized uh, as well. And there's uh, a $20 million uh, deficit in the uh, pension fund. And of course, we would want to make sure, I hope, that any workers that might get laid off, that they would uh, get proper severance and so on. But uh, so what's the position of our government with regard to the workers and the, the shortfall in the pension uh, fund at the site? Masi, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister responsible for finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you know, uh, this is one of the, the difficult parts of this entire proceeding is that we see and we feel uh, very keenly the fact that it's residents of the Northwest Territories who are going to be affected and it is difficult when there are a few levers that the government can pull to necessarily protect every single time and every single employee that is being affected by what's happening with Dominion. So again, we want to ensure that we're providing an atmosphere that allows that mine to reopen while protecting our environmental securities, but as far as being able to do a lot in terms of directly impacting on the protection of those workers, we are not going to be in a position to do much. Um, you know, aside from continuing to advocate at the process itself with legal counsel at the process to say, you know, to explain to the court and make it clear to the court that this is not just one small mine with only a handful of people there, that it's actually a tremendous contributor uh, to employment in the north, both directly of those that are affected, uh, but also uh, indirectly to a number of uh, northern businesses. So we are playing that role, we are speaking out, and uh, I, I believe that our message is getting through. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Frame Lake. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the uh, Minister for that. I just hope that part of our messaging is that we do have workers at the site, they do have rights, and we want to make sure that they're protected because pensions aren't, fit, aren't paid to these workers. Guess what? They're going to come back here. They may end up on income assistance. It's going to cost our government uh, something as well. So, um, But I, I guess this really gets to the broader question, Mr. Speaker, of communications around what we're doing and, uh, and the and I don't want to get into the specifics of the court proceeding, but the only place you can actually, I can find any information about this is in the media and on the uh, receiver's uh, website. Uh, I see that the uh, court protection has been extended now to November the 7th, but it, it, how, how does our government actually communicate what it's doing uh, in terms of the court proceeding and how, how is it trying to communicate that to the broader public as well? Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister responsible for Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the court proceedings are public proceedings, and so to the extent that our council is present uh, and speaking at those proceedings, that certainly is a public forum and a public arena uh, where that message is being transmitted. Uh, beyond that, Mr. Speaker, I, I, don't, uh, I don't think I have turned away a single media inquiry to ask further questions about this, uh, and I've spoken to the media on many occasions about that and will continue to make myself available to do that, and I'm more than happy to continue to answer the members' questions here. Um, and uh, so I, it's certainly my expectation that that message is going out um, and it is being made clear and we're using every opportunity we can to, to get that message out. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, member for Frame Lake. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the Minister for that. Um, I'd just uh, like to know a little bit more about how she intends to keep uh, regular MLAs informed about what's happening and what the position of our government is that's being put forward uh, moving forward. Merci, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister Responsible for Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, to the extent of keeping regular MLAs informed, uh, you know, to date, uh, the last couple of occasions when more information became available to uh, to the Department of Finance or Department of, Infra of ITI, uh, in fact, I think the very last time um, that we received information in the morning, uh, we turned around and got that out to MLAs that same day within hours. Um, so we're, we are going to continue to try to work on that kind of time scale, that when we get information about what might be occurring uh, from one of the parties that's relevant to these proceedings, we will turn that around as fast as we can. As I said, in this case, it was within hours. Um, beyond that, Mr. Speaker, 
with respect to the position of government for the respect to the MLAs, we'll certainly include that there. Uh, if there were, uh, you know, and uh, as far as putting out media information and media announcements, uh, again, that's in fact that same example, that same day, not only did we first get information out to MLAs, we then within a few hours after that got an, an information statement out to the media. So um, while a turnaround time of hours, Mr. Speaker, is asking a lot of the staff and the departments, um, we have managed to meet, meet that kind of a time scale and we'll certainly continue to do our best to, in the future to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Frame Lake. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the Minister for that, and I will acknowledge that uh, I don't think she, <laughs> pretty quickly after sometimes she finds out about these things, she does share it with us. So I, I want to give her credit for that. Um, but it seems to be changing almost uh, daily or monthly, and uh, I'm just wondering what kind of lines of communications uh, the, uh, our, our government keeps with uh, some of the creditors, uh, Union of Northern Workers that represents some of the workers at the site, um, even the insurance companies that have the surety bonds, Dominion uh, itself. Uh, what kind of, uh, if the, the, the uh, minister can speak in broad terms about uh, the lines of communication with other parties uh, around this issue. Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister responsible for finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's, uh, you know, perhaps, uh, I'm not sure if irony is quite the right word, um, but the pace of private industry certainly does often move quite a bit faster than, than government, so it's uh, a bit uh, interesting that as a representative of government, I'm being asked to, to try to keep up with what's happening in private industry, but that really is the nature of this. There is ongoing communications between these private parties, uh, an ongoing process of bids, uh, and in one case, one bid was, was uh, withdrawn, you know, and we're certainly hopeful that another bid may well come forward. So again, and ultimately this mine can reopen. Um, as far as communications, Mr. Speaker, there is an ongoing court proceeding, so we always have to be conscious of that uh, in terms of the kind of communications that we have and discussions that we have. Uh, there are communications open between the department uh, and certainly with Dominion as with uh, any of the large, uh, or with any uh, business or industry here in the Northwest Territories, um, that line of communication is there. Similarly with the surety bond holders, those lines of communication are there, but um, you know, that, doesn't, that, that certainly will not make Make me privy to the kind of internal conversations or negotiations uh, that they have ongoing between them. Um, but certainly to the extent that we receive information about what's happening, we will certainly continue to do our best to make sure that uh, the people of Northwest Territories and businesses are kept, a, kept aware uh, once we hear that something uh, is happening or may be changing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. The time has expired. We'll uh, move on. Thank you. Written questions. Written questions. Member for Kamlik. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have three sets of written questions today. The first is for the Minister of Finance, and the question is, what has been the impact of COVID-19 spending to date, including the number of dollars that have directly contributed to our gross domestic product, the number of businesses saved, the number of jobs saved and or recovered, the projected impact of new or proposed spending, and how many businesses and jobs were lost in the Northwest Territories as a result of COVID-19? Mr. Speaker, the second set of questions are also for the Minister of Finance. Over the last five years, what amount of the capital budget has the Government of the Northwest Territories carried over? What has been the reason for the carryovers by category? Do the reasons point to internal or external capacity challenges within the Northwest Territories? And what gaps does the Government of the Northwest Territories identify to facilitate spending government capital dollars? And Mr. Speaker, the third set of questions are for the Minister responsible for the Northwest Territories Housing Corporation. According to the Northwest Territories Bureau of Statistics, 42.7% of Northwest Territories homes are in need of at least one major repair, and Government of the Northwest Territories major home repair funding programs require applicant homeowners to have homeowner insurance. But because of the remote location and limited services available in most northern communities, residents do not qualify for homeowners insurance. How does the Government of the Northwest Territories intend to support homeowners in remote northern communities to access homeowners insurance? How many Northwest Territories homeowners do not qualify for home insurance because of their community location? And three, how does lack of homeowners insurance and associated disrepair drive northern homelessness? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for, Thank you, member for Cam Lake. Written questions, written questions, returns for written questions. Mr. Clerk. 
Mr. Speaker, I have a return to written question 14-192 asked by the member for Frame Lake on June 10th to the Minister of Infrastructure regarding contracts for work related to the Tolson Hydro expansion. Mr. Speaker, I have a return to written question 16-192 asked by the member for Nunakput on, July, on June 11th, 2020 to the Minister of Education, Culture and Employment regarding income assistance regulations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Returns for written questions. Returns for written questions. Replies to Commissioner's Address. Replies to Commissioner's Address. Petitions. Petitions. Reports of Committees on the Review of Bills. Member for Ditcho. Bussy, Mr. Speaker. Your committee would like to report on its consideration of Bill 3 an act to amend the Public Highways Act. Bill 3 received second reading in the Legislative Assembly on March 13, 2020, and was referred to the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment for review. On October 14, 2020, the Standing Committee held a public hearing with the Minister of Infrastructure on this bill. The committee is awaiting some information committed to by the Minister during this hearing. The committee thanks the Minister for her commitment to provide additional information and is looking forward to concluding the review in the near future. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, in accordance with Rule 74.1c of the Rules of the Legislative Assembly of the Northwest Territories, I move, seconded by the Honourable Member for Prem Lake, that the review period for Bill 3, an act to amend the Public Highways Act, be extended for 120 days. Masi, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Ditcho. The motion is in order. To the motion, all those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. The Standing Committee on Economic Development Review of Bill 3, an act to amend the Public Highways Act, is extended for 120 days. Thank you. Reports of committees on the review of bills. Reports of committees on the review of bills. Reports of standing and special committees. Member for Framley. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Your committee would like to report on its consideration of the matter of privilege referred by motion 5-19-2 on March 11, 2020. To date, the committee has held numerous meetings to discuss this important and complex issue. A public hearing previously scheduled for October has been postponed to November the 17th, 2020, to allow the committee to further promote public engagement on the use of official languages in this Legislative Assembly. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Honourable Member for Hay River North that the review period for this matter of privilege be extended for 120 days. I'll see Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. The motion is in order to the motion. All those in favour? All those opposed? The motion is carried. The Standing Committee on Rules and Procedures review of the matter of privilege referred by motion 5-19-2 is extended for 120 days. Thank you. Tabling of documents. Tabling of documents. Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I wish to table the following four documents. Government to the Northwest Territories response to Committee Report 1 19 brackets 2, Report on Long Term Post Pandemic uh, Recovery, Recommendations to the Government to the Northwest Territories. Uh, Government of the Northwest Territories response to committee report 2-19 bracket 2 report on long-term post-pandemic recovery Recommendations to the government of the Northwest Territories Government of the Northwest Territories response to committee report 3-19 brackets 2 report on the long-term post-pandemic recovery Recommendations to the government of the Northwest Territories and a follow-up letter for oral question 340-19 brackets 2 domestic violence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Premier. Tabling of documents, Minister responsible for Finance and ITI. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to table the following six documents. 
Follow-up letter for oral questions 153-19 bracket 2, GNWT Public Service Succession Planning. Follow-up letter for oral question 313-19 bracket 2, providing GNWT staff who leave the territory with two weeks special leave. Follow-up letter for oral question 197-19 bracket 2, business incentive policy and business incentive program. Follow-up letter for oral question 224-19, bracket 2, Frank Channel Bridge. Follow-up letter for oral question 268-19, bracket 2, support for entrepreneurs and economic development policy funding delays. And follow-up letter for oral question 333-19, bracket 2, Business Advisory Council. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Tabling and documents. Minister responsible for infrastructure. Speaker, further to my return to written questions, 14-19 brackets 2, I wish to table the following document. Tolson Hydro Expansion Project Contract List from September 1st, 2015 to September 1st, 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Tabling of documents. Minister responsible for education, culture and employment. Mr. Speaker, I wish to table the following two documents. Follow-up letter to oral question 259-19 brackets 2, responsibility and preservation of government art, and follow-up le letter for oral question 317-19 brackets 2, pandemic relief funds for education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Tabling of documents. Tabling of documents. Colleagues, pursuant to section 43 of the Ombud Act, I hereby table the 2019-2020 Annual Report of the Northwest Territories Ombud. Thank you. Tabling of documents. Tabling of documents. Notices of motion. Oh. oh, sorry. Tabling of documents. Member for Frame Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I wish to table the following two documents. The first is uh, an email from our time Yellowknife about just recovery for the Northwest Territories. Uh, second document, Mr. Speaker, is uh, an opinion piece in the Hill Times dated June 10th, 2020 by the Premier Cochrane uh, entitled uh, COVID-19 has made the North's quest for equality a steeper climb. Merci, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Frame Lake. Tabling the documents. Tabling the documents. Notices of motion. Notices of motion. Motions. Motions. Notices of motion for the first reading of bills. Member for Yellowknife North. Mr. Speaker, I give notice that on Monday, October 19th, 2020, I will move that Bill 11, Legislative Assembly Officers Standardization Act, be read for the first time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Notices of motion for first reading of bills. Notices of motion for first reading of bills. First reading of bills. First reading of bills. Second reading of bills. Second reading of bills. Consideration and Committee of the Whole of Bills and Other Matters. Consideration and Committee of the Whole of Bills and Other Matters. Report of Committee of the Whole. Report of Committee of the Whole. Third reading of bills. Third reading of bills. Mr. Clerk, orders of the day. Orders of the day for Friday, October 16th, 2020, 10 a.m. Prayer, minister statements, member statements, returns to oral questions, recognition of visitors in the gallery. Acknowledgements, oral questions, written questions, returns to written questions, replies to commissioner's address. Petitions, reports of committees on the review of bills, reports of standing and special committees, tabling of documents, notices of motion, motions, notices of motion for first reading of bills, first reading of bills, second reading of bills, consideration and committee of the whole of bills and other matters, report of committee of the whole, third reading of bills, orders of the day. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. This House stands adjourned until Friday, October 16th, 2020 at 10 a.m.